Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 90, Science Faction Thorium. It's hard to believe we've been on the air this long to see Thor's Day, the Scandinavian element. Yeah, that's right. Thorium, of course, is uh, the element that carries around a hammer, which strikes lightning into his uh, opponent's hearts. It's also an element on the periodic table. Of course, it's radioactive, up at 90. Thorium has been used in things like thorium reactors, which is a kind of nuclear reactor that it works uh, probably a little bit better than uranium reactors. Thorium's easier to get, so that might be the future of nuclear reactors and nuclear power. So it's also used in things like thorium-uranium dating, which is kind of like Match.com for aliens. It truly is the Chris Hemsworth of elements. And I am the Chris Hemsworth of this podcast, your host, comedian and archaeologist, Robert Timothy. With me is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing? What am I, the Chris Evans? Am I the Bruce Ban? Am I the Hulk of this podcast? You're like the Paul Giamatti of As the this rhino? podcast. <laughs> yes. I'm Paul Giamatti. Everybody nobody respects Paul wow. Giamatti. Wherever I go, we will just say, there's the fat, bald guy. Philip Seymour Hoffman's dead. Do you think I did more work? And, but it hasn't happened. And our science expert for the evening rejoining us once again is Justine. Hello. Justine, how are you? Good. Thank you very much. Yeah, you just tried to steal my hello, didn't you? Yes. You just tried to steal my long, extended hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Only one person talks like Mrs. Doubtfire in this oh, show, and that's oh, him. Right, that's right. right. Uh, R.I.P. All right, and of course we are broadcasting here from the Madhouse Comedy Club along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego. If you guys love science faction, love science articles, but can't wait for our weekly podcast to come out, go ahead and check out the website, www.thesciencefaction.com, for all the recent science articles coming out, and a little bit of comic wit thrown in as well. All right, guys, let's get this show on the road. I can't wait to get started with science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, guys, article number one, paralyzed, schmeralized. A paralyzed man walks for the first time ever without surgery or an exoskeleton or a lame storyline that involves the ability to use one's legs coinciding with the loss of one's telepathic abilities. He's a doctor. He published. Get out of his ass. Either write a paper disproving him. I, I'm just saying, in that lame X-Men movie, the, the whole thing was he could walk or have telepathic abilities, but he couldn't have them both at the same time. Well, the movies fucking suck. The, yeah, the, it was, it was ridiculous because you would think, we'll pick the telepathic ability and then just take over the mind of a large oafish man near you to move your legs around Weekend at Bernie style and you're fine. Or like Hodor. Yeah, exactly. Hodor. <laughs> you would think he could control anything. He could control a dinosaur and tell it to move, but his own nerves and his yeah. own leg can't mm-hmm. even do it. Well, there's no it. brain there. He's yeah. got, he's got no that brain. problem. No, or, but here's the thing. Now, Professor X is going to be able to both have telepathic abilities and walk, thanks to some new research done. He'll be unstoppable. Describing the results in the Journal of Neuroengineering and Rehabilitation, this particular research team's goal was to allow the patient to regain voluntary control of his legs using his brain, but without the need for invasive brain surgery. We've done similar things like this with brain monitors stuck into the brain. That's neurosurgery. There's obviously a lot of risk to that. They wanted to see if they can make a way to do this without all that risk, removing the negative side. So to achieve this, the researchers created a brain-computer interface system using an EEG. You know, same thing they put on your head that looks like Cerebro, ironically enough, Mm -hmm. that allows you them to monitor your brainwave, see what's going on. They just kind of put this helmet on, and that helmet reads the patterns of brain activity while the patient thought about walking. So there's kind of the first training, like, all right, think about walking while wearing this helmet. I wonder if that counts as exercise, by the like, way. Like, do they just think, of, like, they think about how they're running and, like... Yeah. Cool, Te- and then it just tracks it. Technically, if you put Cerebro on Charles Xavier's head while he slept, it would just think about walking. That'd be the only thing, then. <laughs> all his dreams, just him walking. <laughs> That's all I dream about. So then next, he went, underwent training to learn how to acquire brain control of an avatar walking within a virtual reality environment. So they created a computer simulation in which this thing would walk if certain signals were given. He learned to imagine walking. They measured those signals. They made those signals make the avatar walk. And now he practiced moving this avatar around a 3D virtual environment. Did he also fall in love? <laughs> <laughs> he did, but it was with Sigourney Weaver, so it didn't count. <laughs> Do you think they got this Avatar idea from that movie, Aliens? 
it was it's pretty similar with Sigourney Weaver in that big mech thing. Yeah, I never yeah. thought about that. Good analogy. <laughs> so that's because there's so many machines in this. Wow, two Sigourney Weaver ones. <laughs> Once he achieved this, he then had to build up the strength in his leg muscles that had atrophied over the last five years of being paralyzed. So they they used electrical stimulation combined with weight shifting maneuvers, which again I, I have to imagine is just one of the research assistants walking up to him with a handheld taser and nailing him in the ass every couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Told you can't feel it. Do your worst. Stimulating the muscles. How about now? Stimulating the muscles. <laughs> After his muscles were reconditioned enough to stand, it was time for the really hard work to begin. Instead of going for it straight away, the team got him to practice walking movements while he was suspended a few centimeters off the ground. As he thought about walking, the brain signals read by the EEG cap bypassed the damage that was in his spinal cord that paralyzed him and were pinged into electrodes that had been positioned around his knees, providing muscular stimulation. Nineteen sessions later, the man had improved so much that he was ready to put his feet on the ground. So wait, when they suspended him, did they hire an outside third-party burly dude, or did mm-hmm. they just use like a lab tech chimp? No, it was Hodor. We just talked about that. Yeah. <laughs> Hodor. Yeah. Lab Hodor. That's the only way it works. <laughs> it was a lab. lab Hodors. Yeah. It's just a giant lab Hodor in a ironically smaller lab coat than a normal person would wear. I know. Do they work in the same lab as those uh, miniature human paleontologist scientists? Yeah, the ones that they shove down that hole to go find all those bones. Yes, that'd be a so, comical lab. Yeah, it w- it's all of them. They they can actually form a Voltron type uh, person to fight Lab Hodor. <laughs> <laughs> It's very fragile. So now that he got to this point, they had taught him how to do it. They had created a system that could read his brains. They had then taught him how to walk around in a virtual environment. Then they taught taught him how to walk around in a real environment while suspended in the air. Finally, they found a system that could support his weight to keep him from falling over, and he was able to successfully translate what he had learned to walking completely unsuspended. Over time, he got it better and better until he could walk a few meters on his own. That's a really big deal. I mean, they basically... Oh, totally. That's amazing. They, they, they hacked this guy's legs. Yeah. When they were choosing a weight system to suspend him, do you think they just took his word for it? I mean, this guy was in a wheelchair for most of his life, or do you think, like, no... No, no, he's he's only in his wheelchair for five years. He got paralyzed five years ago. Well, I mean, it's totally amazing, though, because, I mean, surgery really takes a toll on people. Yep. And so, like, this whole fact that a lot of older people who are paralyzed, they can't go through surgery. This is a great way for you to do that at home, I feel like. Right. Not only that, but think of all the practice and stuff that it takes to get used to it and good at this. Even if you go through the surgery, you might be one of those people who can't make it work anyway. Mm-hmm. This is a way to figure it out beforehand before they cut you open. It's like reteaching all your nerves to do something else. Right, and sometimes different nerves. How noticeable are all these uh, electronics? Pretty like noticeable now, but later, you know, Bluetooth that shit. It should be fine. <laughs> and this would be great if we could use this non-invasive technology to cure paralysis or at least offer an in-between between surgical implantation procedures that may be more precise than this and nothing at all. This will be a nice intro way. Also, like we talked about, this is where they can learn the actual techniques to do it before they have the surgery full time. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when they have to train him? Like, you need to train an avatar to take a shit. You need to train an avatar how oh, to God. ejaculate. You're right. So it wasn't maybe it wasn't just walking around. They actually had him mimicking a lot of it. What about this? Now, what about they put the EEG on him. They have him walking around in the environment doing all these things in this virtual environment. Then they go, all right, Bill, it's time for lunch. We're going to take off. Uh, do you want to sit here? Do you want to come with us? No, no, no. I'm good. I'm, I'm just going to walk around a little bit more. Okay, we'll be back. But they're looking at the monitors, and all of a sudden, they see the avatar sit down and start masturbating. Oh, my God. <laughs> Even in the virtual world. Yeah. Wait, so it can only be in the virtual world. That's the thing. He's just oh, waiting for them. Yeah. He's like, it's been five years. <laughs> it's Imagine been five years since I jerked now. off an avatar. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, it turns out it has nothing to do with his paralysis. All right, a couple of questions from my panelists. Number one, how do we scale the technology so that setups like this are available to any paralyzed person who wants it? Well, I uh, read an article before I came here actually about uh, how they have wireless energy being able to be transferable. So if you're talking about electrodes, what if there was like a little like zip, zip gun or something like, you know, and you can just point it at different parts of your body and like shock that area? I'm going to take Justine's idea one step further and say that, yes, we should taser Damien. (laughs) I mean, we got to get your legs back in working condition. Uh, You do realize I'm a voting member of who the next co-host is. You're just going to threaten me blatantly like that? Thanks, Bobby, for translating. It's for science. It's for science. (laughs) I had Bobby filter out all the female passive aggressive and just tell me what you really were saying. (laughs) 
As Damien, how so do you think we should scale this technology up? I think we should scale it to be compatible with Wi-Fi. So you, <laughs> you, you set it up on a Wi-Fi network, and then you would control everybody else's legs within the network? <laughs> well, I mean, if I was a proficient enough hacker, and yeah, I'm going to coding class. and I'm Share legs. Planning to paralyze myself <laughs> later. Well, you know, that brings up a good point in question number two, which is, these are all just electrical signals that are being transmitted around that we use to control our own bodies. But eventually, the signals will be crossed or hacked, like in your Wi-Fi example. What do you think is the worst case when one of these paralyzed people start controlling the body of another paralyzed person? And what will they end up doing with it? There's the obvious answer of a ton of this is Sparta kicks. You know, <laughs> just drop kicks all day. Just whatever. Oh. So what? So you think as you think every paralyzed person's goal is to do the this is Sparta front kick and knock somebody into some kind of pit or Correct. recessed area. I think that the people who are hacking these leg units are the ones who want to see it. It's a pretty effective move. <laughs> but there are also a lot of advantages, right? Like, what if uh, I don't know how to sea walk, Bobby? I need for you to hack, hack my legs. Okay, I like this. So now you're a perfectly able individual. I'm a perfectly able individual, but there's something. Thing you can't do and I can and so I take over your body and do the activity to make you look better mm-hmm. there's also a downside I could sabotage your three-legged race team a lot easier <laughs> <That's> right wow <laughs> I like this I like that a lot I like the idea that you're not necessarily getting hacked you're subcontracting almost w- what if you just didn't want to go to work you know you could put the helmet <laughs> on someone. you take over somebody else's body you let somebody else take over your body at work and they do all the actual manual labor. Meanwhile, you're at the beach uh, jerking off while all the researchers aren't watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, like, I trade with a prostitute or a prostitute trading with, oh, I'm tired of getting fucked every day. I just want an office job for once. <laughs> and then there's some cat lady office. <laughs> It's like uh, Airbnb, but for bodies. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Justine, what do you think is going to happen when one paralyzed person is able to control the body of another? And what do you think they're going to do with it? I mean, I, I really like Damien's idea of switching the bodies and everything. Because, <laughs> like, I mean, can you imagine the new Craigslist stats you would see? It's like a body available for exchange. And yeah. It's like, yeah, instead of having a personal assistant, you can just literally switch the body. Or what about this? You got a smartphone app that does it, right? So now we, we're going Tinder style. And, and like, you got <laughs> you got this thing. All of a sudden, you're in the parking lot. You're walking to your car. A bunch of dudes surround you. They're about to beat the shit out of you. You just get on your Tinder app, your your thing, and you exchange for, you know, a jiu-jitsu black belt. You're like, quick, take over my body. I need some help. <laughs> That'd be actually really cool. <laughs> Wait, even, all right. You know, there's like, you can have Siri or your Garmin talk to you in different voices. You know, maybe it'll read it through your directions as Snoop Dogg. Well, what if there were different styles of walk you could set? It's like, I'm walking, but I have it set to crunk. Yeah. Pop lock. (laughs) I have my drive set to ghost ride. (laughs) By the way, ghost riding would be a good term for when you let somebody else take over your body. (laughs) Oh, I like that. I like that. Ghost ride, my brother. Ghost ride, my brother. (laughs) Uh, Question number three. The surgical version of this will involve implants that will allow all of this to happen. Eventually, we'll be able to use this technology to not only repair injuries, like in the case of paralysis, but also to increase humans' inherent abilities. What increased ability will humans have when this technology is fully developed? Because you could could imagine, right, them being able to process things faster than your normal brain nerve system can so maybe you're a little quicker you know you could think of upgrades where this isn't something you do if you're hurt this is something you do to to have better vision to have better something else you know what there probably will be some increases like the ones you mentioned but i'm more focused on the potential decreases we're missing out on if you lose your limb eventually there will be a robotic limb one day Right. With super strength, probably uh-huh. a laser on it if you want, like a blade that comes out of the foot. But if you have just your regular old legs, just a Wi-Fi signal on your legs, I mean, that you're just getting the same ability to walk. So you're saying this is just going to be the first in a step of other increments where, that we become more and more cyborg-like. I'm looking at this as beta versus VHS. Mm-hmm. Like, we're going with VHS right now when the better beta system is just, it's just a little bit more. It's just cost a li- so you would say we should just t- start chopping people's limbs off and replacing them with robotic counterparts. Mm-hmm. I think if you're a guy and all of a sudden you found out you know, your legs are crushed, hey, we're able, you know, you're just never going to walk again, but we're able to save your legs. You're like, fuck. And meanwhile, the, your partner in the fire engine next to you is losing his legs, getting sweet robotic legs. You're on disability at home, and he's back on the job. And firefighter of the year. Uh, I like how you made a RoboCop firefighter. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> 
And Justine, any idea about some possible improvements that this will make for humanity? I feel like it's definitely the sex industry is going to go first. They're definitely going to hop on that wagon first. How many guys would probably maybe download the program to let them be better in bed? Like, oh. Or girls or whatever. Like even this. You know? what, what about this? What if you can get the response rate? In other words, the the stimulation that's being felt as somebody else is banging a hot porn star. Yeah, with think? the EEG. It's yeah. really sexy. You, so you're you're experiencing <laughs> the sex somebody else is having. It's it'll be like the next generation yeah. of porn. I yep. like that. That's Do you experience cool. it with like a really sexy RoboCop fireman? No, just just the just just the hat on <laughs> with all the wires. Really sexy. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the robo fi- because firefighters have robo to fight firefighters. less and less fire. The robo firefighter would really do a lot of like foosball playing and chili That'd making. Be a like great that's sequel, robo firefighter. <laughs> Until a big fire gang, like a big pyro gang, breaks out amongst the city, and it's up to RoboCop to take it's up them. To robo firefighter. firefighter to take them down. <laughs> All right, guys. Article number two: Antidepressants plus blood thinners fight cancer, meaning that depressed people with high blood pressure are finally seeing the benefits of their curses. <laughs> Scientists have been exploring the connection between tricyclic antidepressants and brain cancer since the early 2000s. There's some evidence that the drugs can lower one's risk for developing certain types of brain cancers. But when given to patients after diagnosis in a small clinical trial, the antidepressants seem to show no effect as treatment. So they thought, oh, we think we might have something, but it doesn't seem to be working in clinical trials. Let's look a little bit further. So in a study appearing in Cancer Cell on September 24th, some researchers found that antidepressants work against brain cancer by excessively increasing tumor autophagy, which is basically the process where cancer cells eat themselves. They, they kill themselves. That sounded like uh, new, the new running back for Oklahoma State. Autophagy? Yeah. Autophagy. Two more, my name's two more autophagy. He's a good explosive back, you know, not really good, great between the tackles. But once he gets outside... The scientists next combine the antidepressants with blood thinners, which are also known to increase that autophagy. And they use this as a treatment for mice with the first stages of human cancer. Mouse lifespan doubled with the drug combination therapy, while either drug alone seemed to have no effect. So this is one of those really interesting things that we're not sure exactly how this is working. The data kind of suggests that the two act together by disrupting in two different places the biological pathway that controls the rate of autophagy. So basically... The two drugs work together to hyper-stimulate that whole process of, I'm going to eat myself. This cell is going to eat and kill itself, which causes the cancer cells to die. Importantly, the combination therapy did not cure the mice. Rather, it delayed the disease progression and modestly extended their lifespan. So we're not saying this kills all cancer. This does not get rid of cancer. It basically keeps it from growing further, slows down its growth rate, stops it from getting bigger and bigger. This would be one of a certain type of treatment rather than a cure. So it was able to extend the torture of the mice. Yeah, you can continue yeah. torturing these mice. You can continue a poking things in their face. Experiment. Yeah, absolutely. You think these are the only experiments we're doing on these mice? We've got foot cancer things going. <laughs> we're taking notes all over the place. Uh, we've got a little boot that's hooked, a tiny little boot that's hooked up to a little kicking mechanism for our ball kicking oh. test. <laughs> Just over and over. Things more tumor and swollen testicle than bone at this point. Oh, my God. (laughs) A couple of questions for my panelists. Number one, very interesting to see these readily available drugs may be an effective treatment option. What will that super evil big pharma do to keep it out of the hands of innocent cancer sufferers? They'll just call it something else. Instead of calling it antidepressants and blood thinner, they'll call it super amazing drug. And then charge a whole bunch more. And then talk about all the horrible side effects of their drug versus just taking antidepressants and blood thinner. (laughs) It is sad that we were living in a time where a 32-year-old hedge fund manager, you know, buys up a pill, sells it for many thousands of times its original rate, and everybody gets mad at the drug companies and they're like, "This has nothing to do with drug companies. This is this dude." <laughs> totally. I think this drug is probably not going to make it to market. I think they're going to find some problem with it, just as you know, big pharma keeps autism in the mix in their vaccines. I mean, do you think they don't have power to do this? I mean, question number two. <laughs> Cancer is the body's own cells growing out of control. Essentially, it's the body fighting itself. How will we utilize this fact in the future to come up with new creative ways to fight cancer? I'd say stay the course, but if you want creative ways, you've got to let in more people with liberal arts educations into your labs. I mean, maybe they don't know all the big science and all the Right, they don't have terms. the science background. But who's to say that them jamming out to John Mayer in the background isn't helping the other members of the team? They're like a bard, mm-hmm. if you will. 
Uh, I'm sorry, both of you got that wrong. The correct answer is you have to basically put an, enough stress on the cells at a young age that they want to kill themselves. It's it's <laughs> it's what we call the Japanese model. So yeah. we're we're gonna just put in so many tests and stressful elements to their young adolescent selves that they have a 25 percent suicide rate. I don't care how much tentacle porn they get their hands on. Nothing's saving them. <laughs> nothing. Nope, nothing. And lastly, will this finally cheer up depressed people? We have one drug that can make them happy and prevent cancer. No, they're inconsolable. Truth be told, they always want a better drug. You know mm-hmm. what? They just have a bad outlook. You know what our grandfathers did when they got depressed from war and everything? They drank. And, and got that was cancer. Fun. And beat their wives. Simpler time. I, 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 I support a woman's right to beat her lesbian wife. <laughs> Call me old-fashioned. Yeah, and I also respect the right of the dominant male in a gay relationship to beat the subversive male in that relationship. Of or, course. Or a protective next-door neighbor when they come over to ask what the problem is. <laughs> All right, Justine, do you think this will finally cheer up depressed people? I would say that it's not just drugs that would help a person get better. Um, I definitely am a huge believer in therapy, so no, no. I guess in that sense, it, it won't just be drugs that will make someone feel better. Uh, well, you just have a bad life outlook. Drugs are the solution <laughs> to all of our problems. All right, <laughs> let's move right on. Drugs are the solution to all problems. To science fighters. Science fighters and science fighters. Which side are you on? It's a little confusing, I know. It's a double entendre. You know what? Just listen. You'll, you'll like it. Okay, guys. Uh, very interesting. This week's science fighter is Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall? How could she be a science fighter? I'm sorry, Justine, you're clearly mistaken. Jane Goodall's a very respected scientist. You clearly misunderstood the bit like I have. No, 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 she got it right. Uh, She is a science fighter. In this particular case, Jane Goodall was fighting against science. Obviously, she can understand what I'm saying when I make the distinction between science fighters and science fighters. It's complete bullshit. It's the same inflection. You're saying it the same way. I want to see your phone. (laughs) Did he text you before the show? Uh, Obviously, this is something that everybody else can understand except for you. You're the odd man out. Shouldn't feel weird about that. You know, it's just you are the one person who can't get this straight. Straightforward, easy to get bit. I just don't get it. I, it, it. In the ad that you put out for a co-host, must be willing to fuck with Damien. Is yeah. that like is that just in the parentheses? <laughs> so uh, as Justine very astutely pointed out, and Damien blabbered his way through misunderstanding, Jane Goodall is this week's science fighter. Uh, she Ooh. was just on Bill Maher last night, and Bill Maher was chatting with her a little bit about uh, conservation and all that stuff, which obviously I see very eye to eye on her with. Until they got to the fact that Jane Goodall is a bit nutty now. Keep in mind, she was a primatologist. She researched that stuff. She was uh, out in the field doing primatology research, which, by the way, modern primatologists criticize because she did most of it wrong and a lot of her findings were wrong. Um, They would do things like feed the chimps to get them there, which caused all this conflict that she then reported in chimp society. And it's like, eh, it's not really there. You caused that. Uh, But, I mean, she was an early forebearer. And, I mean, nobody had even made it with the chimp before she (laughs) Oh, my God. True. (laughs) But to to her credit, a very dedicated 55-year study of chimps in the Congo. She certainly did a very good thing for science. But we have to realize that just because somebody's an expert or or somebody who's contributed in one form doesn't mean they are in the other. We should look at the experts in their own fields. And one of the problems with Jane Goodall is she's kind of nutty when it comes to other fields. And she proved that when she was on Bill Maher. She's proved that before by saying she believed in Bigfoot. She's proved it when she was on Bill Maher last night when she started talking about a book that she wrote a forward to called Altered Genes, Twisted Truths. And it's about basically her fight against GMOs. And it's written by a quack doctor who misrepresents a bunch of studies to try and make it seem like there's this great conspiracy that are that, that the government and scientists are involved in to make the people think GMOs are safe. And the problem becomes that is a idea that comes from people who don't understand how science works. If GMOs harmed us, those would be that would be found repeatedly in numerous independently done experiments. They just aren't. The only experiments that they were able to show are ones that have been discredited over and over again that were not peer reviewed and published. Basically, there is no case for what they're arguing. And the only thing that she tries to utilize is arguments from authority. The the actual rhetoric of the book itself is really, really bad and misleading. And in this particular case, Jane Goodall is quite strongly fighting science. And I would say at this point in her career, she's actually probably become more of a science fighter than she ever was a science fighter. You looked me directly in the eye Yep, as mm-hmm. you said it the exact directly. same way. 
I got it. Justine understood mm-hmm. me. The audience knows what's going on. It's a slight inflection. You yeah, it. you're just you're not. It's really easy, Damien. Science fighters or science fighters. You, I just yeah. I did it again. See? Yeah. yeah. No, no, I get it. He did it again. Yes, yeah. he's and, and you're you're following him. I'm perpetuating. I'll be slashing. Two sets of tires on my way out. I see what I'm saying. (laughs) So this is a good cautionary tale. One, anybody who's going against whatever all of the published literature says is likely probably wrong. Um, But two, anybody who is an expert in one field shouldn't be taken as an expert in another field just because of that. And you should look at the people who actually know what they're talking about in that particular vein. Sounds like somebody who can't talk to chimps talk to me. I can also speak to Sasquatches, which is why I know they exist. (laughs) Wow, what do Sasquatches tell you there, Jane? They're really hard to find, and they always pick up after themselves, species-wise. <laughs> no wonder we're not getting them. Yeah, they're really clean. <laughs> yes. Conservationists like myself and Sasquatches believe in take only pictures, leave only footprints. They go a step further and don't leave footprints. All they know is that in the Sasquatch community, there's plenty of buzz about that hot bitch Jane Goodall. Oh, really? Sasquatches are just constantly talking about you. You're a woman in her twilight years, so to speak. Uh, it seems like maybe they, Sasquatches would like somebody younger. Or... Oh, no. Sasquatch women have let gravity take them in a way. Um, I am actually have the ideal. I am the Janet J-Lo. But they see the... other human beings from afar. To, to them, you are the hottest woman on Earth? Well, I roll around naked, unlike <laughs> most campers and what rot in the Canadian Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. also am not afraid to compliment upon a well-hung male Sasquatch when I spot one. <laughs> That's usually how you, you pick them out of the trees, right? <laughs> like, There's a big hairy dick walking along. The- oh my god, it's a Sasquatch. And despite my age, they can still smell me in estrus. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, I don't think you get that anymore. All right, <laughs> I know, let's like- move right on to I Call BS. I Call. 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 Ring, ring. I Call. BS. All right, I call BS is the game where I read my panelists for science articles and they tell me which ones are real and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Yeah. I, I could use a win, Justin. You know, like, like, listen, oh my you god! Me earlier with the science fighter thing, but five straight losses that were that have been so oh, no. perpetually embarrassing. Each one like more embarrassing oh, than god. the last. She as was it goes the first through. time. I was, it was, she yeah. was the first time. Yeah, that was. I was like, wait. Wow, he has lost. <laughs> He's just. It's sad. In it's sad. Game. It's sad. But let's see if we can keep this streak going. All right. Article number one. Researchers have done a new analysis supporting the hypothesis that viruses are living entities that share a long evolutionary history with cells. Number two, researchers have been able to identify individual people just based on the microorganisms they breathe out, like a breath fingerprint. Number three, a new antimatter engine patented by a student is smashing efficiency records. And number four, the oldest evidence of salmon fishing in North America has been found in Alaska dating back to 26,000 years ago. All right, guys, we will go on through and see what your answers are. Follow along at home and see what you guys get. You should be able to beat Damien pretty easily. Fuck Article yourself. number one, researchers have done a new analysis supporting the hypothesis that viruses are living entities that share a long evolutionary history with cells. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, but what the study doesn't tell you is that they only had three-fifths the personhood as a cell or bacteria. Oh, so constitutionally, politically, it wasn't. a living entity. Yeah. That's right. They had to fight to get that three-fifths, too. All right, and Justine. I want to say BS because that, that's kind of against what I've learned. I thought that bacteria and viruses were different for that reason. So um, I'm going to call it BS on that one. All right. Article number two, researchers have been able to identify individual people just based on the microorganisms they breathe out like a breath fingerprint. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, and it's terrible news for alcoholics. Why would it be bad news for alcoholics? Because I think now we're going to start being racially discriminated against. Uh, Cops are going to fall around. They're going to say, this guy's blown. He's an alcoholic. It's in the record. It's in public record. We can follow him around. Wouldn't you not have as many microorganisms because the alcohol would be killing all the stuff in your breath and lungs, and therefore when you breathe stuff out, you wouldn't have as many microorganisms in there? Well, that's, that's why it's suspicious. little. They, they either think it's leukemia or overactive immune system, alcoholism, he eats radiation, all right. gargles with rubbing alcohol. And, <laughs> and Justine. Well, and I keep thinking like there must be like... Instead of a fingerprint machine, there's like a nose or something. So you have to blow into it. That lets you know. Oh, like a breathalyzer? Like a breathalyzer, but with the shape of a nose. 
Let's hope it's a nose. It sounds weird. I mean, it's totally possible, but what would stop someone from masking the scent or masking the bacteria or, like, eating poop and being like, well, look, at there's fecal matter. There's a few things that will stop you from eating poop. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> like off the what? top of my head. Like, I have no idea why. Why not? You know what? I was an officer. I'd say that guy wanted to get away with it. That yeah. guy wanted it. He wanted to be not caught more than I wanted to catch him. Exactly. exactly. So, Justine, is your final answer science or bad science? I would say science. I think that's possible. All righty. And article number three, a new antimatter engine patented by a student is smashing energy efficiency records. Damien, is this science or bad science? I'm going to say bad science because this student who invented this engine is not smashing energy efficiency records. He's smashing records as a Hall of Fame college quarterback. So he patented an antimatter engine that allows him... Football's his love, but in his spare time, he dabbles in antimatter... All right, and Justine. I hope this is a science, because if that's any closer to going light speed, I'm all for it. So I'm just going to vote for science. All right, and lastly, the oldest evidence of salmon fishing in North America has been found in Alaska dating back to 26,000 years ago. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, and I'm glad that Professor Grizzly is finally pulling his weight in the community. He's a bear. He's the only... <laughs> uh, he's the one. Yeah. Of course, a bear would be the only yeah. one who could find salmon. You have to yeah. picture a... He's dressed like a nerdy scientist outdoors. He's dressed like you are when you go to work. Right. But he has like a monocle because he's a classy bear. All right. Okay. Well, then. <laughs> and Justine. Find evidence of 26,000-year-old salmon fishing in Alaska. I want to say that's science, <laughs> but 26,000 years ago... How did how did the Earth look, or how did Alaska look at that time? Well, a lot younger, so the tits <laughs> were better. Younger, but I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> a lot more polar bears. Yeah, a lot more polar bears. Um, yeah, I want to say that's science. <laughs> All right, let's see how we did. Article number one: Researchers have done a new analysis that supports the hypothesis that viruses are living entities that share a long evolutionary history with cells. Damien thought this was true. Justine thought this one was false. And this one is science. The general consensus has been for a long time that viruses are non-living strands of RNA that aren't technically alive because they don't have their own metabolism or ability to replicate. They have to hijack both of those from a cell. This new study focused on the vast repertoire of protein structures called folds that are encoded in the genomes of all cells and viruses. So the folds are the structural building blocks of the proteins, giving them their complex three-dimensional shapes. We've talked about misfolding ones before with prions. By comparing the folding structures across different branches of trees of life, researchers can reconstruct the evolutionary histories of the folds and of the organisms whose genes coded for them. And basically, they looked at all this, and they looked at the known folds of 5,000 organisms represented by every branch of the tree of life. And by using advanced bioinformation techniques, they identified 442 protein folds that are shared between cells and viruses and 66 that are unique to viruses, indicating that at some point there is some shared line of lineal descendancy that would indicate that viruses might indeed be alive themselves and not just hijackers. They can be a parasite like anything else. Very interesting. Article number two, researchers have been able to identify individual people just based on the microorganisms they breathe out, like a breath fingerprint. Both of you thought this one was true, and this one is science. We emit what's called a microbial cloud, and researchers have found that it's also unique enough to be able to identify individual people. So all of your information is, in fact, in the cloud. It's in the cloud, guys. (laughs) So they expected that they'd be able to detect human microbiomes in the air around a person, However, they were surprised to find that, the, that they could identify most of the occupants just by sampling their microbial cloud. It was unique to each individual person. They found that participants in the experiment could be identified within four hours of sitting in a room and basically breathing out. And they would have petri dishes and stuff around, pick up the individual microbiomes of that person, compare them to somebody in that room later on and be able to tell, oh, that's Damien. You know, it's a whole bunch of sweat and semen in the breath. Like, that's definitely Damien. So, God, it's growing out of the Petri dish. Either Damien or Pigpen from the Peanuts game. (laughs) So, uh, very, very interesting. That might be a big thing in forensics later on. The same way we think about DNA, you know, leaving DNA at a crime scene. Maybe you'll leave your microbiome at a crime scene just by breathing out and they'll be able to be like, oh, yeah, you were in this room for sure. So This is why we need killer robots. Or I can hijack your body. Or a Ooh, you use the thing, hijack somebody's body, do it to, Im- to incriminate them because their microbiome and DNA is everywhere all over the place. They're the ones who killed them. 
Yeah. Article number three, a new antimatter engine patented by a student is smashing energy efficiency records. Damien thinks this is false. Justine thinks this is true. And this one is bad science. Oh. It was a student actually did invent a super, super efficient engine that is smashing efficiency records, but it is not an antimatter engine. This is a little clue in there for you guys. Ion engine. It's an ion engine. It was invented <laughs> uh, by a guy from the University of Sydney. I just wanted it to be true. And the drive can go to Mars and back on a single tank of fuel, but its first application may be just moving around satellites. Now, to be fair, when you're thinking about this engine, this is not something you could blast off from Earth on. You would need rockets to do that. This is a very, very low-powered engine that essentially emits an ion at a time, and that whole equal and opposite force thing pushes the craft forward. It's very, very efficient because it's literally the most efficient form of propulsion. However, it's not super powerful. It can only be used in the vacuum of space. If you were to take this engine around to, like, labs in the Midwest, NASA labs, uh-huh. that, you know, where they like their big gas-guzzling NASA yeah. rocket engine. Get that Prius engine out of here. <laughs> we want a Saturn V up on this bitch. I'm going to roll oxygen and hydrogen all over this thing. <laughs> all right. And article number four, the oldest evidence of salmon fishing in North America has been found in Alaska dating back to 26,000 years ago. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is... Bad science. Professor Grizzly. The 26,000-year-old was your clue there. Uh, Americas were not occupied at that time, at least as far as we know. So the oldest evidence of salmon fishing in North America has been found. That is a real article, but it is 11,500 years ago. We didn't uh, exclude ursine fishing. Oh, the the bears. You thought it was was Professor Sanders. Yeah, they've been doing it for a long (laughs) time. That's right. So they recovered 308 specimen of uh, of salmon bones and the cremated remains of a three-year-old child from the central hearth of a residence. A double infant burial with grave goods were found 40 centimeters below the hearth, and an additional 29 fragments of burned salmon species were found within the pit fill. Uh, this was a group of people that were among the first human beings coming into the Americas at this time. They were settling rivers up in the interior of Alaska. This is not anywhere near the coast. They were settling these inland areas. They were living in these very extreme conditions right after the last ice age. This is really, really interesting stuff. Uh, I'm always interested to know how they survived in those really extreme climates, those really extreme areas, whether or not those people continued to migrate down or died out up there because we know the Dorset people who occupied that area later didn't come until about 5,000 years ago. So, you know, what happened to these type of people? Did they end up being the wave that swept down, or did they try and hang out in Alaska and it didn't work out for them? They went to Boca. <laughs> Is that an anti-Semitic comment As on your part? they got older, okay. they went to Boca. I see, it's I see. warm down there. You don't have to deal with the winters anymore, <laughs> the arthritis. Oh, New York, it's winters. It's only Meshuggah. All right, guys, let's move on to Hey Science, listen up. Hey Science, listen up. All right, guys. Hey, Science Listen Up is where our comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado, takes science to task for what he views as their shortcomings. Damien, why don't you go ahead and take us away? All right. Thank you. Thank you for uh, using Manisha's voice or perhaps an Oompa Loompa. It's hard to tell. We've had both on the show. Welcome to my corner of the show, where the shills for big dinosaur and big science take a back seat to the truth. Er, the truther. Me. Today we go old school and tackle the original conspiracy that the earth is indeed flat. This is the retro hipster conspiracy theory, and for good reason. Wait, wait, wait. Are you saying there's a conspiracy that the earth is flat, or there's a conspiracy that the earth is round? (laughs) I am saying that the earth is flat. Okay. The conspiracy is that it's hidden from us. Okay. All right. Obviously a ridiculous claim. Can you just go ahead? Well, not so obvious, maybe after you listen to the rest of this bit. Ever since that liberal know-it-all troublemaker and probably animal pornographer, Galileo, dreamed up his heliocentric universe and all his carefully detailed observation, the sheeple of this world have been gobbling it up. Uh, Can I just interject that Galileo was talking about whether or not the Earth rotated around the sun or the sun rotated around the Earth uh, had nothing to do with whether or not the Earth was round, which of course everybody knew at that point. All right, well, then I have some serious questions for the Wikipedia page okay. that I got this information <laughs> from. However, since I know you two drank Big Science's Kool-Aid and will resist the truth, the truther argument, I've written some questions that will hopefully enlighten you two and de galileo you. Question number one. We all know that time zones were invented by alcoholics to justify the saying, it's noon o'clock somewhere. By the way, I like how alcoholics just need to wait till noon. <laughs> like, it's not it's four it's not o'clock somewhere. It's like <laughs> if, if you're justifying it, yeah, it could yeah. be any time. So it's even more comical that it's noon as opposed to five. 
<laughs> such, such a hot time to drink. <laughs> <laughs> However, time zones are also used as a wacky explanation for the radical basic science community to explain their heliocentric nonsense. My question is this. How did all three of us graduate for, or receive certificates of completion from high schools? And how are we failing our children? Yeah, how are we? And I still can't figure out if you're fighting heliocentricity or the flat I'm earth. I'm like... trying to figure out what your argument is here, crazy guy. My arguments make sense to me okay. when I'm doing this character. <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> All right, fine. You, you failed to address my questions because big science is afraid to get to the truth. Fine. Question number two. Magellan's circumnavigation of the globe is often cited as a reason why I'm frequently called an insane person while debating my points. So I suppose my question is two-part. Should we really trust some nerdy-ass pussy who was killed by yo-yos? And why did the Filipino people who killed Magellan hate science so much? He was killed by yo-yos. That's true. What? And, uh, yeah, this, yo-yos were a Filipino weapon at the time. That's true also that Filipinos hate science and want to kill us all. So true story both ways. <laughs> Sorry, I can't argue there. Yeah. Now, just as an interjection here, are you one of the people who believe that there is a flat earth Yes. In which the North Pole is the middle of like a disc, and then there's a giant ice wall along the the outside that keeps all the water in. You're trying to make me sound ridiculous right now, and I don't appreciate it. Like okay. I came here with science. I'm at, at one side of the map in which you can go no further. <laughs> Is the North Pole okay. and the other side. And there's also East and West Poles. Oh, I didn't realize oh, that. Oh, got now, it, what got keeps it. all the water, like the ocean water, in this flat thing? The turtle who's balancing on his back <laughs> has been trained for okay. eons. He's had a lot of time to practice. Balances it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Different yeah. phases of the Earth are, you know, like, for example, if he's going over a rough patch where he's walking. Can I ask you something? What is the turtle standing on? You just blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Keep going. <laughs> A bigger turtle, Bobby. <laughs> it's, a bigger turtle. it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> Question number three. We have all seen pictures of a round Earth. The images are everywhere. There's also globes, things like that. Yet never once have I seen a photograph of a flat Earth. So just for my edification, so I know whether to blame the secret shadow government or the Illuminati, how deep would a conspiracy have to go in order to heliocentrically indoctrinate us or flat Earth indoctrinate us to the degree in which we have? Well, it'd have to go pretty far. I mean, especially if you consider the fact that you can see the curvature of the Earth when you're in an airplane. Like, if you're in an airplane up at 35,000 feet and you look, you can actually see the Earth curve. It's very obvious. So you, the conspiracy would not have to just be scientists, map makers, cartographers, NASA, eh, science, everything like that. <laughs> it would also have to be you every time you take a flight at a window seat. I know I might be shooting myself in the head here in case I ever do satellites uh -huh. as, a, as a conspiracy theory, uh -huh. but satellites. I totally think so. <laughs> they're just sending signals from the moon, and they're using the mm -hmm. paralyzed, schmeralyzed um, technology in order to, you know, make us see a curved Earth, but there's really a flat Earth. Well, unfortunately, you believe in the moon conspiracy and that yes. the moon is exists. <laughs> And so I don't even know. You're clearly already drank too much Kool-Aid, Justine. <laughs> Thank you, Damien, for bringing us to this exciting new venture into science and maybe some of its downsides. You know, who knows? Maybe science doesn't have it all figured out. That's why I like... Just a bunch of nerds. You really keep us grounded with this particular yeah. segment. Yeah. You could argue I'm the only true scientist on the show. Nobody could argue that, but it's funny to hear you say things that you couldn't argue. That's humorous for everybody involved. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us here on Science Faction 90. Please come on back next week for Science Faction 91. Just eating show's over. How about you and I go trolling for Squatch Dong? You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right.